it's Instagram on this one. So I'm going to go Instagram. Oh, okay. I got to bring the other thing in. Yeah. Hold on. Let me bring the studio in for this one so I can put the uh, Instagram stuff in. Okay, hold on. You ready? I'm ready. Let me cut this sound off. Okay, no echo, right? No echo. I will close the other thing up. Now let's go back over here. I'm apologizing to you guys for that. We're waiting. I'm sorry. It's Layla. Inshallah. And okay. Okay. All right. Uh oh. <clears throat> okay, guys. Inshallah. What happened here? Okay, why does that look like that? Is it because of this? Okay, assalamu alaikum. Can you guys see me and hear me? <clears throat> yes, everything's fine. I'm on Instagram now too. Oh, one more thing. I'm sorry. I'm coming in now. Let me set it up for the different channels on Facebook. Okay, hold on. Sooner followers. Okay, guys, I'm getting ready. I'm I'm almost set up. Group new Muslims. Okay. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Can everybody hear me? Everybody see me? I'm, I know I'm late with my class today, but as you all know, we've had so much going on here as Sunnah followers. I had to broadcast um, Sheikh um, Abu Usama, who's in a different time zone, 
And uh, I didn't. I went a couple of days without any sleep. So I had to get some sleep. Alhamdulillah, I got some. So I feel more energized. I feel better. Walaikum salam. The video's fine. Oh, there's Brother Buck. Assalamu alaikum. There's Sister Laylee. By the way, Laylee, did you send me that a message today? Did you send me a text message today um, um, about Iftar? Where did you send it to? I meant to I wanted to ask you, where did you send it to, Sister Laylee? Oh, not today. That wasn't today. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Okay. I wanted to make sure because I was looking at the uh, my what app stuff. It makes sense. Okay. All right. Okay, because I got confused. Y'all know my anxiety, my anxiety. Okay, good. I wanted to make sure. Y'all know I suffer with anxiety. And when I be reading stuff, I get anxious about stuff. Yes. And Brother Buck, oh my goodness, look at this, guys. Um, mashallah. For those of you who don't know, our brother, um, his real name is Quentin. Quentin lives out in the, he, you know, he's a farmer. He lives out in uh, uh, the country. And mashallah, you got some baby chickens today. Eight baby chickens? Oh my goodness. Are you gonna be raising chickens, brother um, Buck? You raising chickens? That's some good halal food. Alhamdulillah. So that's great. You know, so, you know, I was thinking about you. Um, you know, with that farmland you got, I was going to say, you can raise your halal food, you know, and make you some money selling it to the, um, the shops in town. That's something you might want to consider doing. You know, since you got that farmland and stuff, if you can raise some, uh, you let the, the, the let the uh, the the masjids know. You know, we you know if you get you some uh, sheep, especially some sheep during this time of year. This is when the uh, like here where I live in Amish land, the Amish people make money off the Muslims during this time of year when we do the Eid al, you know, the Adha, the sacrifice and stuff, because we always go to um the Amish people invited our lambs and stuff and slaughter from them, <laughs> you know, that's a thought. If you got all that, if you got enough land, you might want to start raising your own, a couple of beef, some sheep, you know, your chickens and the Muslims can get their halal produce for you from you. Plus your stuff is grain fed. You can have the organic and all of that going on too. That's a way to make some money. So rather than the people going to the uh, Amish to buy they, they stuff, they can come to you. But let the, uh, the, the masjids that's close to you and the other towns near you, let them know that you are Muslim. And that's why I'm saying you can let them know I'm a Muslim and my animals are all organic. Whatever towns or cities that are close to you and they can come to you and rather than going to the Amish people uh, to get their uh, uh, beef and stuff and their lambs and chickens and stuff. That's something that's just a thought you might want to, you know, you can have. Yeah, and, and let them know that you raise them organic too. Exactly. Alhamdulillah. Brother Quentin. Yeah, I lived in uh, Southern Ohio, the foothills of Appalachia. Foothills of Kentucky, and uh, a lot of we a lot of the people there raised their own uh, cows and chickens and ducks too. Yeah, yeah, and that's a big mosque, G. 
Let them know that you're Muslim, you know, and you got your own animals and stuff, and your stuff is grain fed. They can come to you and get their uh, stuff instead of going to the the, um, the non-Muslims. Yeah, he's out in the country where he has to drive a long way. He'd have to drive an hour to get to a mosque, like where, like I used to live. When I lived in Southern Ohio, I had to drive an hour to get to a mosque too. Yeah, you're out in the country. Yeah, he does the real, the real hunting. He shot his first squirrel and ate it. Yeah, you see what Sister Laley said uh, where in California. Uh, you see like what Laley said in California. That's what the Afghani people do. She said in California, the Afghani people have the biggest land. They raise sheep and cattle and, and stuff and sell it. Yeah, that's the best thing to do. That's what I would do with all that land you got, brother. I'd, I'd raise my sheep and cattle and sell it to the Muslims. The Muslims can come to you to buy from you rather than going to the Kafirs to buy. Yeah. That's just a good idea. Yeah. And also, guys, uh, before we begin today's class, there's something I want to address to a, a question that was asked to me by one of the brothers here. I tell you guys, um, and this is one of the reasons why I really, really, really like the class uh, that Dr. Asim is teaching, the understanding of the uh, the Quran and understanding the prayer, because Dr. Asim speaks Fusha. Fusha is the classical Arabic, and Arabs don't speak it. They speak their different slang dialects, and uh, you, it's really important to understand the meaning of these Arabic words. Just like we learned with him yesterday, when we call the Hail El Falat, you know, you're not, it doesn't mean come to success. That's how we translate it in English, but in Arabic, it means more than that. It means come to a regrowth, being reborn, like a farmer plants a seed and cultivates it and watches it grow. That's what it means. You know, if we understand the Fusha, the original classical Arabic with a lot of these hadiths and verses of the Quran, then we wouldn't be so messed up as a nation. We spoke yesterday uh, in this class about how people uh, misinterpret the words of the Quran, how Allah says, do not put yourself forward in his presence and do not put yourself forward in the presence of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and a lot of people will ask what does that mean what does it mean to to put yourself forward in the presence of allah it means to misinterpret what allah says because you don't understand what he's saying or to take the words of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and misinterpret them too and I'm gonna give you an example. We were talking about makeup earlier. And this is a question that I get so much. You know, uh, there is nothing in Islam that forbids a woman from wearing makeup. The prophet's wives wore makeup. The female companions wore makeup. And what woman doesn't wear makeup? But what we're forbidden from doing is going to the extremes to make yourself look like a prostitute and in turn go out and pick up men. That's what we're forbidden from doing. But like the way you see me with my coal on and my lipstick, this is not going to the extreme. I don't look like a prostitute, okay? I look like a woman of dignity, a woman of humility, okay? But if I were to put that glitter and all that other stuff on and put to make my lips with that, uh, what that, that stuff they wear that makes your lips shiny and all that, that's another thing. Uh, that's seducing. That's prostituting. And we have to understand that when you learn the fool's high, learn how to read those El Hadith in the classical Arabic, you will see that the prophet's wives wore makeup. 
you would understand the hadith of Um Atiya, which is in Bukhari, where she says the, that we never, we women never wore dark colors. We never wore dark colors unless we were mourning. If we were in mourning, we would remove our makeup. She says it right there in the Hadith of Bukhari. She says, when we were in mourning, we would remove our makeup and our jewelry, and we would only wear dark colors when we were, when we were mourning. And that's the same thing Aisha said. You know, Aisha said, when a woman mourns, that's when we wear clothing that has no designs on it. That's when we wear clothing that is dark in color. Aisha's favorite color was red, for those of you who don't know. Aisha wore lots of red and pink. We have the Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, you know, of how she had one of her favorite gifts was a gift that her nephew gave her of a beautiful red silk dress that he had got from Persia. Aisha loved to wear red silk and so did the, the otherwise they wore beautiful garments and Aisha had a favorite veil the veil she wore when she wore it was a Turkish veil and it was pink in color as I told you guys the uh uh the burqa did not exist Arab women didn't walk around wearing burqas back in them days the veils they wore were were thin so that the air the, it could get in. Their veils were uh, thin enough to protect them from the sun. This is culture. This ain't religion. This is culture. They wore veils over their faces and so did the men to protect them from the sand. But the veils were thin enough where they could breathe through them. They weren't thick like these masks we have to wear because of COVID. And Aisha had a beautiful, uh, 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 thin, uh, uh, pink Turkish veil from Turkey that she would wear. And like I told y'all, their face veils look like what you see in the movies, Haji Baba. And Aisha wore trousers. All the Arabic women wore trousers because they were women of the camels. They wore trousers underneath their clothing. Their trousers were harem pants, okay? I told you guys that. And that these hadiths are all in Bukhari and Muslim, but you got to know the fusha, okay? To understand what you read. And so when I was telling you guys this, I got an email from one of the men here. And I wanna address it before I do my lecture. Because y'all know I love Aisha. I love all the companions. My role model has always been her. I try to emulate her. I try to be another carbon copy of her. The same way you brothers call me Jezebel, the same way you brothers slander Layla Nasheba, y'all accuse me of being a prostitute. Y'all accuse me of being a Jezebel. That's what a Jezebel is, a prostitute. Well, they slandered Aisha the same way. They accused Aisha of being a prostitute too. They accused Aisha of being a daughteress too. Why? Because she wasn't what you wanted her to be. Allah gave women rights. Allah liberated women. There is no need for feminism today. There is no need for women's live today. Allah liberated women in the dark ages. Why do you think the, the people in the world, there were more women converting to Islam in the dark ages than anybody? Because it gave women and slaves rights that they never had before. Most of the people that converted to Islam were slaves too, because Islam gave rights to them, lifted them up. Allah took us out of the dark ages and moved us forward. So Aisha was one of those women who understood what her rights were. Allah said women and men are equal spiritually. A woman has the same chances as a man of making it to paradise. Aisha understood that. Couldn't nobody tell her what she could or couldn't do other than Allah and her husband. And the prophet Muhammad sat with her and taught her 
because she was like a sponge. She soaked up everything. She was very, very intelligent. She was brilliant. She was a genius, just like Layla Nasheba, a genius and soaks up everything. Aisha had a photographic memory too, just like Layla Nasheba. So the men of her time hated her and they hate her today because number one, she also had a strong character too. She was very outspoken, very outspoken. She knew her rights, she knew her role and she knew your rights and your role too. And she didn't have a problem verbalizing it, okay? Most Arabic women didn't. Remember the Arabs, these were a nomadic warrior people. Why did Allah send Islam to that part of the world? Because it was a barren land. You had to have hope to live in, in, in that part of the earth. They were a warrior, barbaric people before Islam. All they did was fight each other, tribal fights. And whoever won would take the women. The women were always taken as captives and raped and whatnot. So those women grew up being fierce. They were warrior women anyway, all of them were. All the Arabic women were warrior women. That's why they wore trousers. That's another reason why they wore trousers, which are known as harem pants to us, underneath their abayas, because you never knew when a war was gonna drop, jump off, when a tribe was gonna invade you. Those women had to be prepared. They'd go on the battlefield. They would go on the battlefield with the men. So did the Viking women, so did the Roman women. Back in those dark ages, the women would fight alongside the men. In fact, whenever there was a war, they would bring the women because whoever won would take them as their part of the booty. So these women were warrior women anyway, all of the prophets wives were, they all were, that was their lifestyle. But Aisha was more fierce than most because of who her father was and how she was raised. So a lot of the men were intimidated by Aisha because she was brilliant intellectually. Also, she was a beautiful woman. She wasn't beautiful like Um Salama. She wasn't beautiful like Zainab. She wasn't even as beautiful as Um Habiba but she was a very attractive woman. Put it that way, she was attractive. She was very attractive, okay? She had self-esteem and she had that pride that many of the women of her nation had because of their roots, their genealogy, who they come from and all of that. She came from a prestigious family. Her father was highly respected, okay? So the men were intimidated by Aisha anyway, because of who her father was, who her husband was and her brilliance. And she didn't hold back on her tongue, okay? So they slandered her. If you can't, if you wanna take down a man, you come after his women. That was the Arabic tradition back then. You wanna hurt the prophet Muhammad, Come after his favorite wife. You want to hurt Abu Bakr, attack his daughters. They slandered Aisha, accused her of having sex when her husband left the home, when she didn't. They accused her of being a Jezebel. They accused the same crap y'all say about me, which I could care less about. I'm like Aisha, I know my the lawful and the unlawful. It ain't my fault that you don't know what's lawful and you don't know what's unlawful. I know the lawful and the unlawful, especially concerning myself. Nothing you or, or no shake, no mufti, no man on this planet. No man, and I'm still waiting for the man to bring the dalil that women can't be beautiful and wear makeup because there's no such dalil. I've been waiting 62 years for it. Can't no man on this planet tell me that I'm supposed to put a burqa on, walk around with one eye like an ugly cyclops and wear dark colors and no makeup and just be uh, inhibited. That ain't Layla. No, you can't tell me that. I'll show you how much man you ain't. But anyway, 
this is the question for today. A brother sent me this email. He said, and this hadith is authentic. He's speaking about the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. This hadith can be found in Sahih Bukhari, just like the hadith that shows women wore makeup. That's in Bukhari too. The hadith about women wearing colors and designs and silk and brocade and flowers. That's in Bukhari too. Stuff is authentic. But this brother found this one and it's authentic too. The hadith about uh, the men The man saw Aisha's legs. And not just Aisha's legs, but Um Salama's too. Like I say, I'm starting to question whether or not I have a bunch of Shiites uh, following me. Because for people to slander Aisha to this day still, the Shiites are big on this. Yes, that hadith is authentic. Yes, the men did see Aisha's legs. They saw her bangles. But did you read the hadith? You have to read the whole hadith, guys. You have to know the story. You, this is why you can't teach yourself the religion. This is why when I had a sister ask me the other day, oh, Sister Layla, I'm going to get a Tafsir book and we're going to read it and all of a sudden the knowledge is going to come. No, you read a Tafsir book and you don't understand this religion, you're going to be even more lost, more confused. Just like when y'all read these hadiths, you will read one sentence, one sentence that says uh, such and such companion saw Aisha's legs up to her calf, up to her thigh. That's just one sentence. And now you're going to think Aisha was a, was, a, was a tramp, a strumpet, that Aisha was a Jezebel. Then you read another hadith that says, not only did this companion see Aisha's legs, but he saw Um Salama too. So now you're going to say Um Salama was a strumpet. And then you read another hadith that says uh, these companions saw Aisha and Um Salama's legs on the bat while they were fighting on the battlefield. So then you're gonna now hear Shaitan making you think, okay, while the men were on the battlefield fighting the battle of Badr, the battle of Uhud, Aisha and Um Salama were prostituting themselves. I mean, you you can put all this stuff in your mind because all you read was two or three sentences. Those two and three sentences are part of a 10 page hadith that speaks about a battle. What happened on the battlefield, unless you know the whole story, you will take one or two sentences and slander the wise of the prophet, which is what these people are doing. Yes, the hadith, that sentence, uh, those two sentences said they saw Aisha, Aisha's legs when they were on the battle for. They saw the jewelry that she had on, which by the way, focus on that. You brothers saying women can't wear jewelry, that women can't wear makeup. This is the same hadith that proves a woman can wear makeup. A woman can wear jewelry because you, the hadith says that they saw Aisha's bangles. Yes, it's, it's true. They saw the bracelets on her, 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 um, her, her ankles. They saw the, the designs on her, the, the henna or whatever on her calves. That's the proof that um, Arabic women wore makeup and jewelry which totally refutes what you brothers say that we supposed to walk around looking like dogs or worse. But anyway, you have to read the whole hadith. You have to know the whole history. Unless you know the history of Islam, you ain't qualified to quote anything because you're doing what we talked about yesterday, putting yourself forward in the presence of the prophet. You're speaking about this religion without knowledge. That whole hadith, if you read the whole 10 page story, it was talking about how Um Salama and Aisha were bringing water to the men. 
They were fighting the battle on the battlefield. The women, like I said, these were Arab women. They went on the battlefield with their men and fought. And some of them fought like Nuseiba did. Other women took care of the sick. Aisha was a nurse. Um Salama was a nurse. They brought water to the men. They would help transport the men back to the mosque, to the doctor when they were wounded. So during this battle, as the men, you know, as, as were, were falling, Aisha and Um Salama and the other women, there were other women too, Um Atiyah, all the rest of them, they were out there providing water to the men, helping with the sick. And Aisha had to lift up. She had to lift up and she didn't have her trousers on in this battle. By the way, there's more to this story. She didn't have her trousers on. Um Salama didn't have her trousers on. So they had on shifts instead, not a baya, which means a baya just means overgarment. Okay, they didn't have an overgarment either. They had a shift on. A shift is like a little, like what do you Bantus wear? Y'all call it a b b begins with a B. The Bantus wear those uh, little one piece, little house dress things, you know. That's what a shift is. Aisha and them would wear shifts too. She just had on a shift. Um Salama just had on a shift. Yeah, it's like a bati, like a bati. Okay. So Aisha and Um Salama were lifting up. They had to raise their shift up to get around the men to give them water. So these companions were talking about how Aisha and Um Salama were helping the wounded how they were going around the battlefield, giving water and helping with the wounded, they would raise their ships up to step over the fallen men to get to the men that needed help. And they'd have to raise them up so you can see, you could see their legs. So now do y'all see why women wore trousers? And by the way, this is the one battle. This is the one time that Aisha didn't have her trousers on, okay? After this battle, that's when she always wore trousers. Because these people could see her legs, that's why she never went out anymore without, a, without trousers on. This, I think, was the Battle of Uhud, I think. If this might have been the Battle of Uhud. It was one of the, or, the, or either the trench. It was one of the early battles. If it wasn't Uhud, it was the trench. Okay. And after this battle, that's when Aisha always made sure that she had her trousers on. So that way, and, and so did Um Salama. So when they lift their, their shift up, you know, you couldn't see their legs. Okay. That's so this hadith is more proof that women wore pants. It's more proof that women wore pants and why they wore. And that pants are not haram. Does everybody understand? It does not mean that Aisha was prostituting herself to the men on the battlefield. It does not mean that Um Salama was prostituting herself on the battlefield. Y'all got to stop slandering these women because you're ignorant and don't understand your deen. And this person named Zak Zakian Samik, you got a, a question you want to ask? This person here, Zak. Zakvan Samik, do you have a comment or a question? Welcome to the world of Layla, Nashiba. The name says it all, Ana Nashiba, Ana Saba. So be careful. Choose your words carefully, Ana Saba, Ana Shiba Ur. So be careful, Ana Shiba Ur. You got a comment to make, do. Samic, bring it. You ain't got nothing to say, Samic. What does yo chill mean? I know what it means. What is that a chill for, uh, Samic? 
You're talking to another Aisha. Anasabur Nashiba. All right. I didn't think you had nothing to say. But anyway, so that's what, guys. So we have to be careful. We have to be very careful reading these hadiths. That's why the prophet said, learn from the people. If you want to learn this religion, you have to sit in the company of the people and knowledge and learn directly from us. You cannot teach yourself this religion by picking up a hadith book or picking up a tafsir book. You cannot teach yourself. If you don't have a qualified teacher, your teacher is shaitan. Your personal jinn becomes your teacher. And he will have you thinking things and saying things that are not correct. Like these people are misconstruing this hadith around. So yes, the men on the battlefield saw Aisha's legs. They saw her henna. They saw her jewelry and Um Salama's because those women were on the battlefield helping and tending to the sick. Tending to the sick. And when it's a battle, you know, there's always certain circumstances. You, if my house caught on fire and I was in the bed asleep without a hijab on, do y'all think I'm going to get up and try to look for a hijab? I'm going to jump out the window to save my life. And if you see my hair and my body, hey, so what? This was a battle. They were fighting on a battlefield. It's about protecting and helping the sick. Ain't nobody got time. This, this, this wasn't a lustful thing. When the men made those comments, they were talking about how failure, how courageous Um Salama was, how courageous Aisha was. They were saying it to show how courageous they were so busy trying to get to the sick to help the wounded that they weren't even thinking about themselves. And that's how we should be as Muslims. We should try to help each other, protect each other, instead of getting caught up in this personal crap. So they weren't doing it to be prostitutes. They were they, The men were saying it to show how these women put themselves right there in harm's way. They put themselves in harm's way, not even concerned about themselves to help their fallen brothers in Islam and sisters in Islam too, because women were fighting too. Y'all understand? But this is just an, another example. And that's why I say, I think I got some Shiites in here. Maybe Samic, uh, Mr. Samic, maybe you one of the Shiites that like to go around slandering my sister. Perhaps you one of those Shiites that want to slander Layla Nasheba too. Hello, bring it. Okay, so y'all be careful. This hatred towards Aisha, this hatred towards me, this hatred towards women in general. This is old stuff. It's one of the signs of the last hour. Who cares? You can say what you want to say, but when y'all speak badly about those female companions, oh, you're going to pay for that. I just want you to know you're going to pay for, you're going to be eating your slander when you're in that grave. And you ain't got to wait to the day of judgment to eat it. You're going to be eating that slander as soon as the law takes your soul. And when he take your soul, he ain't going to take it in a good way. He's going to have it yanked out. And your body, your soul will be thrown back to this earth in a disgraceful way for what you say about those female companions, especially Aisha. And for what you say about Layla Nasheba. Hello. Keep it coming. And by the way, I hope my lipstick looks good for you today. Okay. Take a good look. In fact, take a screenshot. Maybe your wife can learn some tips. Tell her to come into my Zoom room. I'll give her some tips on how to be beautiful because Allah loves beauty. Send your wife and daughters here. I'll teach them. All right. All right. So does everybody understand that hadith now? 
Uh, Fresno, do you understand the Hadith? So if you ever hear somebody use that Hadith, that Hadith is authentic. It's in Sahih Bukhari. Yeah, the man saw her legs up to her calf. Some said up to her thighs. Oh yeah. She was out there taking care of the sick. Okay. Taking care of the sick. And Um Salama too. But after that, they wore their, their trousers on the battlefield. Yeah. And that hadith has a lot of hikmah to show that jewelry is lawful. Makeup is lawful. Decorations are lawful. Wearing a shift is lawful. And how did they know? Let's take it this way. How did those men know that it was Aisha? How did they know that it was Um Salama? Can anybody figure out where I'm going with this? How did the men know that that was Aisha and Um Salama on the battlefield? How did they know? Can anybody answer that question? Because their face was not covered? Exactly. Their faces were not covered. More evidence. That hadith brings a lot of wisdom, which also shows you ain't got a woman that the prophet's wives didn't cover their faces all the time. Because how did these men recognize Aisha and Um Salama? Because their faces weren't covered. How are you going to be out on a battlefield taking care of sick people and fighting with your face covered? Are you people out here with a burqa in one eye? Are y'all crazy? Get a life. So that's more Dalil about that face too. Don't confuse culture with religion. There you go. They didn't recognize them by their legs. <laughs> they recognize them by their faces. All right. So any questions on that Hadith? I hope I answered that Hadith. And uh, be careful. If you guys are hanging around people who speak badly about Aisha, most likely those people are like this Samic dude. They're probably Shiites. And they hate her. She's the most hated companion of all. And the second most hated companion is Umar. They, you will hear more lies and slander against Umar and Aisha than anybody else. They hated them. And still do. So they, stay away from people like that. Yes, go ahead, Lifty. Sorry. Um, you know, uh, you said that they had uh she had henna on her legs. Yeah. So that just tells me how they used to decorate their bodies too. Michelle. Yep, they did. They Arab took women. care of they beautified themselves. Yes. You're Michelle. an Arab woman, you know that that's what yes. Arabs do. Yes. <laughs> Arab women are the most beautiful women. We and Persians too. I'll throw I'll throw it yeah. into Persians too. Those women like to keep themselves looking nice, you know. The only problem was back in them days, they all had a problem with taking baths. But that wasn't just the Arabs, it was the, the Vikings too, you know, and the Rome. Back in those days, they didn't have running water. So the people would beautify themselves and put on perfume to must the smell. And the Arabs were like that too. They just would go without taking baths for long periods, but they love smells. The Arabic people love frankincense. They love musk. They love myrrh. They love all those beautiful, and the Egyptians too. They love all those beautiful smells. They would, you know, rather than taking a bath, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to say that they probably just didn't have enough water back then. <laughs> they didn't because they lived, yeah, water was a commodity. They were in the desert, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a commodity. Yeah. And then what got in, in Egyptians too, that, you know, that part of the world, well, you see why Islam grew in that part of the world. It was a barren part of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, the hope. You had to hope for, for something to survive. Yeah, subhanAllah. Yeah. Yeah, so be careful about this stuff, guys. But if y'all hanging around people that's slandering the prophet's wives and talking about women in a bad way, most likely these are bad Muslims. Stay away from them. And by the way, I hope none of you sisters are going to the mosque for the Eid in no pajamas. Wear your best clothing. But let me talk about that for a minute, too. Allah says, you know, the Prophet, well, Allah says it too. Allah says in the Quran, wear your beautiful apparel to the mosque. 
The prophet Muhammad said, wear your best clothing to the eat. But that doesn't mean to go out and splurge. And we're going to talk about that more because we got about what, three to four, it's just three days left of fasting. You know, you brothers and sisters, wear your best clothing, but that doesn't mean that you go out and spend $200 on an outfit. Okay, just for the E, when you ain't even going to wear that outfit no more, or you can't even afford it. Okay, just wear something nice. Make yourself clean. Take a gusso. You know, make yourself clean. Make yourself beautiful. Like Dr. Asim was teaching in his class, you know, even when we stand up to pray. A lot of people ask me, Sister Layla, why do you wear makeup around the house? I don't go nowhere. I'm in my house. Why do you wear such beautiful uh, 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 house clothing? Why do I get up every day and put on makeup, guys, when I don't go nowhere? I want to look beautiful for a law. My Lord sees me. My Lord sees me. I do this for, to please my Lord because a law is beauty. We're supposed to emulate his names and attributes. A law is beauty and he loves beauty. These are the last uh, days of Ramadan. I want to make sure I'm extra beautiful. I take a bath every day, you know, since I'm in my house. I put on perfume in my house because it's just me. I want, and I got uh, 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 candles burning. My house is clean. My house smells good. So I can attract the angels. The angels love cleanliness. The angels love good smells. I brush my teeth three times a day so that my breath doesn't smell from the fasting because the angels don't like bad breath either. And like the prophet said, why should we stand before our Lord with our breath stinking? So I make myself look nice and presentable for my Lord every day. That's how it is. When you go to the mosque, you guys, wear your best clothing, but that does not mean that you should go out and spend two, three, four, five hundred dollars on an outfit. No. You know, put on your best apparel. Why? Because like the prophet told one man, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw one of the men at the masjid. The prophet knew that this man was, this man was wealthy. He knew that this man had a lot of camels, that this man was not poor. But the man looked, it had on shabby clothing. The prophet asked him, he said, are you poor? The man said, no. I got a lot of money. Allah has blessed me with a lot of stock. The prophet said, then why don't you show your gratitude? Why don't you show your gratitude to Allah for making you have money by buying at least nice clothing? That hadith is authentic too. That hadith is Sahih Muslim. You know, show your gratitude to Allah by wearing nice clothing. If Allah gave you the means, to look nice, why not? That's what I do. Allah gave me the, the, the means to look nice around the house. So I'm gonna show my gratitude to him by staying in the house, number one, and then number two, by looking nice and presentable for him, for him. I do this for Allah. The Tao I'm doing is for Allah. Everything is for Allah. Show your gratitude. Show your appreciation for that, that Allah didn't make you a person that has nothing. The prophet's wives, they looked nice. Aisha, you know, she had a couple of favorite outfits. She was like me. She'd wear something over and over and over again until it falls off. Even though she could afford to buy nicer clothes, I mean, to keep buying clothes, Aisha would wear the same stuff over and over and over again until it fell off, but they were nice. Like this, y'all see me wear this sabaya all the time. I got it off of Amazon and I'm gonna keep wearing it over and over and over until it falls off. Then I'll buy some more, another one to replace it. She had the same outfits, not just one though. She had more than one, but she would wear those, the outfits that she had, she would wear them until they fell off. Then she'd get some more, but they were all nice. They were of good fabric. She loved silk. She loved satin. Her favorite color was red. 
Her favorite color was pink. Anything in the red, she used to dye her clothes. She would dye her clothes red and pink, okay? The prophet's daughter, she had a beautiful red riding outfit. Red was very popular with women, always have been, and still is. That's why it's my favorite. I love red too. When I wear it, y'all say I look nice in it. Y'all say I look good in red and blue. Um Salama love blue. Aisha love red. Okay. You know, so wear your nice clothing, guys. And just, you know, look, it's not about the clothing as long as you're dignified. You know, we're people of dignity, humility, and balance. Does everybody understand that? So if you're going to go to the E, you know, put on something nice. Dress your children up in, in whatever nice clothing they have. Make sure you guys are clean and presentable looking. It doesn't mean go out and pay $200 on a new outfit that you don't, ain't going to wear no more or don't need. Everybody understand that? Okay, any questions or comments about that, about this hadith I went over? Because I want to do the lecture now. We all cool. Y'all understand that hadith? All right. Bukhar. That was wonderful information, very empowering about how the women were back then, how strong yeah. they were. It's very empowering to hear. Yeah, and by the way, guys, I told you all yesterday, uh, just we're not, like the prophet said, we Muslims don't have the intelligence that the Jews and Christians have. What I want y'all to do is go to a museum and just look at how the people used to dress in the eighth century. The prophet Muhammad lived in the eighth century. Look at how the Arab women dressed in the eighth century. Look at how the European with those were more modest times. Okay. Yes, they wore pants. Yes, they wore face veils, but look at their face veils. Are they the kind that you see women wearing today with only one little eye? Did Daisha look like this? No. Nope. How is it that they can tell you how beautiful Layla's eyes were? Layla was the wife of uh, Khalid bin Wali. She was known for her beauty. She was, they say she was one of the most beautiful women you could ever see. And they say the most beautiful part of her was her hair. Her hair came all the way down to the ground. And also they say she had beautiful legs, okay? But her eyes, that nobody could saw her legs and her hair, but the women. The women were jealous of her for beauty. But the, you know, the men saw this, the face and hands. And they say her, she had the most pleasant face. The men said she had the most pleasant face. So that shows they saw her face. And they say of her pleasant face, the part of her face that was the most pleasant were her eyes because she would have big, they say she had super big eyes. Her eyes were real big and she would put the coat on, they were just super big and they were very dominant in her face. It says her face. They didn't say they just saw her eyes. It says her face. She had the most pleasant face. More proof that these companions were not covering their faces all the time. Okay. But what I want you guys to do is go to a museum and look at how they dress back then. Okay. And that way it, it'll make sense to you. You know, how can you be oppressive towards women? This is how they dressed. And they weren't oppressive in their dress, they were covered and modest and beautiful. Subhanallah. But you want to take women today and turn them into a cyclops, have them put on some clothing that you wouldn't be caught dead in. Have them looking like cyclops or how they seeing out this little slit. What the heck? You wouldn't wear that. You won't even put a mask on. You brothers. You can't even get you men to wear a mask for COVID. Y'all refuse to go to the mosque with a mask on, but you want the women to look around, look like animals. You know, how you expect a woman to breathe when you can't, I mean, get a life and stop being oppressive. 
And the prophets' wives didn't look like that. They burkas didn't exist in the eight, not for the Arab women. This wasn't their culture. This was not the Arab woman's culture. And the veils they wore were thin, thin little veils. Haji Baba, Haji Baba, he was always in love. Go watch Haji Baba. That's how they dressed. <laughs> Watch the Prince of Persia. See how the Persian women dressed, the little veils they wore? Watch the Prince of Persia. That's how they dressed in the eighth century, the Arabs and Persians. All right. Okay, any other questions? All right, I'm gonna get to the lecture for today. Let me put the, um, the PowerPoint up. No more questions on that hadith though, right? We all clear on that, okay. Let me fix this too. So I did this. Let me take this. That was the email I got. Let me pause it since I answered it. And okay. All right. In alhamdulillah, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. We only have what, three, maybe four days left of this year's uh, Ramadan? And everyone should feel closer to Allah. Uh, yesterday, I spoke about what I was talking about now. Uh, as we are, as Ramadan begins to wind down, one of the uh, resolutions that you need to make for this upcoming year until next Ramadan, make the resolution to not put yourself forward in the presence of Allah. And don't put yourself forward in the presence of the prophet, meaning don't misinterpret the Quran. Don't misinterpret the Hadiths. If there is something that you don't know, ask the people a knowledge like the prophet said. Don't try to figure it out on your own because you're not qualified. You can't figure it out. You're going to get more confused. If it's something that you need to be to, to truly understand, ask the people of knowledge. So that's what we spoke about yesterday. Make that a resolution. And today what I wanna do is speak about another thing that we all need to work on uh, during these last three days of making a, a commitment. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, wait a minute, hold on, let me put it up. So make it so that, you, wait a minute, hold on. Uh, this move my screen this way. Okay, today what I want to speak about is uh, how we should also make it a resolution for this year, this upcoming year. Not only am I going to make the resolution to not put myself forward in the presence of Allah or the Prophet, but I'm also going to make the resolution that whenever I receive any type of information about this religion, I'm going to verify it first. If someone comes to me and tells me, for example, that it's haram for me to be happy, I'm gonna verify that information. I'm gonna first of all, look at the person who's bringing that information to me. Is this person somebody who knows the dean? And then I'm gonna, before I share that information with anybody, I'm gonna check with the people and knowledge to make sure that it's correct. Just like with this hadith that I just went over with you guys, you know, verify it before you accuse the prophet's wives of prostituting themselves on the battlefield. Verify the information. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so this is what I want to speak about today. And let's look at the, the first point here. What does Allah say? Allah says, in the interpretation of the meaning, O oh, you who believe, if an unrighteous person comes to you with information, you should verify it or else you might cause harm on a person in ignorance and end up regretting what you've done. I want you guys to look at this verse. Nowadays, most of the information that we get about Islam, where do we get it from? We get it off of Google. We get it for we get it from people that we don't know in real life. 
Somebody in a chat room told us this. Somebody you don't know sent you an email. So you don't know if that person is righteous or not. So verify, verify the information or, or don't pass it on. Or you might end up like in this case, slandering the prophet's uh, wives. If that brother had a past that hadith on saying that Aisha and Um Salama prostituted themselves on the battlefield, a stock of Lord, it just makes me angry to hear that. Look at the harm that could have caused. Look at the regret that person would have in the, in when he in that grave on the day of judgment. Okay. So what happened to make Allah send this verse down? Like I tell you guys, every verse in the Quran was sent down because something happened. That's why I'm always talking about the history. What's the history of the verse? What's the history of the Hadith? What happened to cause Aisha to show her legs on a battlefield? She was stepping over the dead. She was stepping over the dead to run and help the people. She had on a shift. She didn't have on her trousers that day. She wore a shift, subhanAllah. So in this case, what happened to make this verse come down? Well, Ibn Abbas tells us, and again, look how I tell you what Ibn Abbas said. Who was Ibn Abbas? Ibn Abbas was one of the companions. He was not one of the four Imams. Of course, he's not Ibn Taymiyyah. He, of course, he's not no Sheikh or no Mufti today. He was one of the original companions. And why would I use him instead of using some Sheikh from today? Why would I tell you what he said instead of what Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah said? Why would I tell you what he said instead of one of the four imams? Well, because Allah tells us in the Quran that the best of this nation were the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah tells us that no one was more devoted to him or understands this religion better than they did. And our Prophet Muhammad tells us to stay upon the traditional Islam. He said the traditional Islam is what I came with and what my companions practice. When it comes to trying to understand the meaning of a verse of the Quran or understand anything, just like you guys asked me about masturbation, I am not gonna sit up here and tell y'all that something is haram when there is no clear verse saying it. Allah doesn't mention anything in the Quran about masturbation, period, dot. Neither did the prophet Muhammad, but Allah told us about other stuff. So since Allah didn't mention masturbation, it must be legal. So why will I sit here and lie and tell y'all based on Imam so-and-so, who was Imam so-and-so? So what I did was I sent y'all what the companions said about masturbation. And I posted it up in the community thing. What did Ibn Abbas say about masturbation? He said it's better than fornication. What did Ibn Umar say about masturbation? He said that we used to masturbate when we went on, on expeditions. He said the prophet never told us it was haram. The men, the young men would masturbate. All it is is rubbing yourself. It's not zina. You're not having relations with anyone. You can't call masturbation zina. What does the Arabic word zina mean? It means to, to penetrate another person. That's not like Ibn, Ibn Umar said, it's rubbing yourself. What did Aisha say? Yeah, we gonna throw Aisha. I'm gonna always throw Aisha in it. Aisha said, it's nothing but releasing water from yourself. That's what Aisha said. It's just releasing water from yourself. So did any of, so none of them said it was Haram. Allah didn't say it was Haram. The prophet didn't say it was Haram. The companions didn't say it was haram. So what would I look like sitting here telling y'all is something's haram? Who am I? Am I better than Allah? Better than the prophet? Did Allah forget something? 
He didn't forget to tell you that sodomy is haram. He didn't forget to tell you that anal sex is haram. He didn't forget to tell you that menstruation relations is haram. So now y'all tell me Allah forgot to mention masturbation when people have been masturbating ever since Allah made Adam and Eve. It happens. So that's an example. When it is something that we're confused about, we refer to those companions. So that's why when I teach my classes and I want to give the breakdown or the meaning of a verse of the Quran, or if I want to give y'all a breakdown or a meaning of a hadith, I'm going to tell y'all what the companion said it means, not anyone else. So the history of this verse, Ibn Abbas tells us what happened was the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent El Walid Ibn Uqba as a messenger to collect the zakat from the Muslims. However, on his way, he heard, somebody told him that a group from this tribe were coming to make war against them. And when uh, Uqba heard this, he was afraid. So instead of going to collect the money, he went back to the prophet and the prophet said, did you get the zakat? He said, no, no, no. He said that the, the king of that tribe refused to pay the zakat and the king of that tribe threatened to kill me. This is what Uqba said, okay? So the prophet became angry and he sent some more companions to go deal with that king. And when the companions met, the king told them, you know, they, 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 they brought the king and took him and brought him back to the prophet. And the prophet told him, he said, uh, why did you refuse to pay the zakat? And why did you threaten to kill Uqba? And the king said, subhanAllah, this is not true. He said, I swear by Allah, I never saw Uqba. He didn't come to us to get the zakat. He said, the only reason why I allowed your companions to bring me to you now is because I was afraid uh, that you that I would be disrespecting you or Allah by not coming to see what you wanted. He said, but Uqba never came. So that's what happened. That's how this verse came down. Here was a companion that was sent on a mission, but he didn't complete his mission out of fear. But instead of telling the prophet that, he came back and lied and said that this man refused. And if the prophet had believed him, he could have killed this man and his whole tribe over a lie. So that's why Allah uh, sent down this verse. Allah sent this verse to confirm that the king told the truth. That's why Allah said, verify any information that you receive from people that you have no certainty about or a person that may have a doubtful character because you could end up hurting someone when that person didn't really do anything to you. So that's why that verse was sent down. And based on this, this is why uh, the scholars, the companions and the scholars after them take great pains in verifying any religious information, including the hadiths, you know, so that way we don't end up, you know, falling into slander or worse things. And for you guys, you don't know these people on the internet that you be listening to, you know, verify it. Somebody tell you that Aisha used to take, you know, prostitute herself on the battlefield. You better verify that stuff. Ask them to explain the meaning of this hadith to you. Give you the story, because all you reading is one sentence anyway. What's the whole story? What happened? What's the deal? Why was this going on? For you end up causing harm to yourself. So, uh, uh, and also, you know, look at the character of a person too. If it's somebody that you do know that's bringing you information. If that person is known for being shady, and his character, if that person is known for being someone that you need to doubt, then be careful what you take from them. 
also in the next verse Allah says in the interpretation the meaning and if you realize you should realize that the prophet is amongst you if he were to obey you and what you want you would be in difficulty but Allah has put faith in you and Allah has beautified it in your hearts and Allah has made disbelief and disobedience hateful to you you are of those who are rightly guided this is a favor and a blessing from Allah and Allah is all-knowing Allah is wise here in this verse Allah is telling us that our example in life as Muslims our example should be no one other than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Instead of looking at these famous Muslim speakers and making them your role model, you need to look at the Prophet and make him your example. This is why I'm always saying, who's the life coach for the Muslim? You can't be a life coach to me. The life coach for the Muslim is the Prophet Muhammad. Why? Because he was divinely guided by Allah. As Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning, surely there is for you in the Prophet Muhammad an excellent example. He's the one that taught us how to handle ourselves in life. And with his death, the divine revelation stopped, but he completed his mission before he died. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning, this day have I perfected your religion for you, completed my favor on you, and chosen for you Islam as your religion. So our example, our example should be the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Did he go around abusing women? Did he treat women like they were dogs? Did he tell you that women were, were, were like dogs? Was he oppressive towards women? Or did he respect women? You know, he should be your example in life, not these other people, okay? So Allah orders the believers to hold the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in high regard. And that's why Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning, whatever the Prophet gives, you take it. And whatever he forbids you from, stay away from it. Obey him. That's the verse I tell you guys to remember because there's a lot of Muslims today who will tell you they don't accept hadiths. They don't believe in a hadith unless it's a hadith kutsi. Or you will tell them that it's haram to shave the beard. They'll ask you, where does Allah say it? Tell them this verse. Allah says, obey the prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And whatever he gives you, take it. Whatever he forbids you from, stay away from it. That's the dalil that a man can't shave his beard. That's the dalil to all of that. Okay. Then Allah speaks about the aims and benefits of adhering to the guidance and example of our Prophet Muhammad. First of all, he's more knowledgeable of Allah and this religion than anyone else. Secondly, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't speak from his desires, from his likes. If the Prophet was to follow our desires, then there would be nothing but chaos. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning. If the truth had been in accordance with man's desires, the heavens and the earth and everything in it would have been corrupted. Okay? So Allah tells us the benefits of listening and obeying and following the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instead of anything else. Okay? When it comes to actions of worship, if the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't do it, then we don't do it. The Prophet Muhammad didn't celebrate birthdays. The Prophet Muhammad told us before he died, don't do to me what they did to Jesus by putting a day aside to glorify me. Okay, but you Muslims are doing it anyway, celebrating his birthday and now celebrating your own too. When it comes to any act of worship, it has to be rejected. 
Because if you don't reject it, you're introducing something new. You're saying that the Prophet Muhammad didn't complete his mission. You're saying that the Prophet Muhammad didn't know everything that he should have known about worshiping Allah. You're saying that the Prophet Muhammad forgot to tell us something. Remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever introduces into this religion something that's not a part of it, it must be rejected. So Allah is calling us to obey and follow the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. By following him and obeying him, this is how we are protected from disbelief. This is how we keep our faith strong, especially after Ramadan. Your faith is built up right now. You're strong. You're on a spiritual high. How do you keep that high for the rest of the year? Into next Ramadan by obeying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I want you guys to remember the hadith where the Prophet speaks about the sweetness of faith. He tells us that if you want to taste the sweetness of faith, you have to first of all love Allah more than you love yourself. And you have to also love the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more than you do yourself. And you have to hate even the idea, even the idea of living like you used to live before Islam. You know, I listen to a lot of, I look on Facebook and I see a lot of Muslims posting up on their Facebook pages how they were back in the day. This is me back in the day and you don't have a hijab on. You sitting there smoking marijuana or you're sitting there drinking alcohol or you at a disco party. That shows that your heart still has Jahalia in it. That shows that you still have an inkling, a desire for this dunya, okay? One of the signs of a believer is you hate the idea of not being a Muslim. You would never wanna go back to that or be reminded of how you were before Islam. You should never wanna be reminded of how you were before then. If you like being reminded, speaking about the good old days, and guess what? That means you still have hypocrisy in your heart. Okay? Love and hate are signs of faith. I want you guys to know that we're not Christians. Love and hate are components of faith. We have to love everything that Allah loves and hate everything that Allah hates. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning. Tell them, O Muhammad, if you love Allah, then follow me and Allah will love you. So in that verse, Allah is telling the prophet, let the people know. They claim that they love me, Allah, then they got to follow you. These brothers out here that want to debate the beard. And I hate to say it, most of these brothers come from Arabic backgrounds. A lot of the Arabic men are not wearing beards. Y'all know that. They shave their beards. They, are, they might let it grow at, for a month and then shave it. Let it grow a month and shave it. This is haram. This is haram. This is haram. Okay? Tell them, if you love Allah like you say you do, you love Quran Kareem. You love Quran Kareem. And you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, then why come you're not obeying the prophet and growing your beard? He said it's forbidden to trim it, forbidden to cut it. If you love Allah, then you would love the prophet. And if you love the prophet, you would obey him. Subhanahu Allah. Okay. So thus we learn from those two verses today that when people come to us with bad information, be it about another person, be it about the religion, be it about anything, you wanna verify what they've told you before you share it with others. Also, we learned that the truth before makes the prophet his example. Oh, we also learned that, learned that the prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam should be our example in life. Everything we do should be based on him and what he, how he told us to do it. 
We should obey him and follow him in everything he's commanded. And until we can fully accept this, then we'll never understand this religion, guys. We'll never be true believers. So again, we're in the last three. Last three, maybe four. Three, maybe four days of Ramadan. I want you guys to work on these resolutions. Like I told you, there is no such thing as an Islamic New Year. But if there were, it would have been Ramadan. Ramadan would have been the beginning of every new year because Ramadan, this is the night of Carter's when Allah shares what's going to happen for the upcoming year uh, with the angels. I want you guys to make it a resolution that number one, from now until next Ramadan, you are no longer going to read the Quran or read a Hadith and twist the meaning around. If it's a hadith, or you want to know what the verse means, or you want to know what the hadith means, you're going to ask a person of knowledge, a person of knowledge to explain the meaning to you. You're not going to sit there and try to teach yourself. No more teaching yourself the deen. I repeat, no more teaching yourself the deen. The prophet Muhammad didn't teach himself. His teacher was Jibreel. And he was the companion's teacher, and they were the Tabi'in's teachers. Okay? Find a teacher. My students have me. I'm your teacher. For those of you who don't have me as a teacher because you don't like me because you think I'm a Jezebel, okay? Hey, I'll, I'll take it. They thought the same about Aisha. What can I say? Hello. You don't want to take your knowledge from me because you think I'm a Jezebel. Fine. You better go find a teacher. Jezebel that. Go find somebody who's qualified and bona fide to teach you this religion because every Muslim is supposed to have a teacher. Okay. Who's your teacher? They're going to ask you that. When you in that grave, y'all going to be asked about that. They're going to ask you, who did you take your knowledge from? Who did you learn the dean from? What you going to say? Uh, I taught myself. Yeah, well, that's why you going into this oven in hell. That's why you getting ready to be put in this oven in hell because you taught yourself and slandered the companions. You slandered Aisha. You slandered Um Salama. You slandered the prophet. So I'm throwing your butt in hell because you taught yourself. All right? So make it a resolution that you're going to find a bona fide qualified teacher and learn this religion the correct way. And also make it another resolution that you will obey the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and everything he said. If the prophet said you can't do it, you ain't gonna do it. Make it a resolution. All right, I'm gonna stop right here. Supana kala huma wa bihamdika, a shadow on la ilaha ila anta, a stock the ruka wa tubu ilake. Are there any questions, there any questions or, comments? or comments? Yes, sister. There is something important. Oh, Dr. Dramali, hold on. MashaAllah, perfect timing. Let's put our Dr. Dramali on here. Get your camera on. Uh, we just finished the rawih. There he is. Go ahead. Um, sister, yes, you're right, the, the knowledge, but uh, sometimes some people they have knowledge but they're following the buddha, buddha blindly we have also to have the, the, the people's knowledge the true knowledge from the quran and sunnah only and that is not easy alhamdulillah sunnah for us at least you can decide who those uh, those people who's following the sunnah who is not like shiuch. a big difference sister layla yes my, my point to your brother and sister, if you want to hear that, yes, you're going to go to the knowledge of shiuch, many shiuch, but also a lot of shiuch reading the Quran, only the beautiful voice in the Quran, but does that mean that person who the Quran, you have a knowledge? Even that person, Arab also, even the Arab person with the beautiful voice of the Quran, there's no fiqh and aqidah understand, you lose it. This is my advice, sister, brother and sister. Yes, this is important. Y'all get what he's saying? Same thing. You know, be careful who you take from. Just because they can read Arabic and, and sing don't mean, look at this. Look what the Shiites said. Look at this hadith. Yeah, they slandered Aisha and Um Salam. Whoever told y'all this hadith, they was on a battlefield prostituting. Look at that. 
And I bet you the man that told him this probably can read the Quran. People, like the prophet said, you know, people will appear, they can recite the Quran beautifully, but it won't go past their throats. They don't know what they're saying. And to slander the companions, subhanAllah, this is bad. So yes, be I, careful, like Dr. Jamali said, that the person you take from, you know, is not an enemy of Allah himself. SubhanAllah. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Jamali, share some more with us. Go ahead. Hadith, you, um, Sister Layla, very important, very, very important. Beautiful voice, but that's Quran, in Quran, but that Quran never read their throat, only their tongue. It's a bit different when the, we comprehend the Quran, comprehend the Hadith, different than memorizing the Quran. I have kids here memorizing this Quran, kids, but not even, but I have no idea what the meaning of Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. That's a, a serious problem, at least for us adults. You know, adults, it's very, very important to authentic imam and authentic sheikh is very is my advice so yes yeah, that is yeah. correct exactly i'm glad because like i was telling the people too a lot of people are, are quick to use google and they don't understand that Shay google is shiite he's a 12er the, the most of the information can, and that's why it takes you to that lislam.org site those are 12ers you know, they're the ones with all this misinformation about the companions, the misinformation. Uh, they don't even accept the hadiths of Bukhari and Muslim, you know, subhana Allah. So you guys have to be very, very careful. Uh, that's why that verse says, verify the information. Verify whatever information that you are receiving. Verify the person that's giving it to you. When you verify Google, you see it's run, it's owned by the Strelvers. They got his big, the big pictures of them with their turbans and their thobe, their robes on. We're twelvers. Verify the information, guys. Jazakallah, Sister Layla, and thank Brother May Allah bless you all, Brother Sister May Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala May Allah make reach everyone Laylatul Qadr last uh, tonight, Inshallah. I mean, May Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala bless our our website Sunnah followers and bless Sister Layla. I mean. It was so nice of him to come in. I love to have Dr. Jamali come in with that. So you guys see, this is important. This is These are the resolutions that we need to be working on, you know, from now into next Ramadan, you know, verifying any information that we receive and the person that's given it to us or that we're getting it from, you know, and also don't, you know, don't put ourselves forward. You know, don't sit there and misconstrue the meaning of these verses of the Quran or these hadiths. Work on this. Teach your children this. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Go ahead. Uh, I don't. I don't know if you already answered this or not. Do you remember the question I asked the other night? This is uh, Brother Murad. He's asking. Uh, do you remember the question I asked the other night about Masjid prayer in the middle of the night after yes. they prayed to Tarawih? Yeah. Would it be wrong for me to pray in the middle of the night with them if I couldn't pray tarawih prayer? Okay, I want you guys to remember the only the, the, the question he's asking about is the witter. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, pray as much as you want to during the night, but just end it with witter, with one rakat to make it odd. That's all. So if you want to pray a uh, hundred rakats, you can pray a hundred rakats, but when you're done, end it with one with, with, with one rakat. And once you make that winter, that's the end. No more praying. That's why when you guys go to the mosque for Tarawi, you're praying the Tarawi prayer with the Imam. When you go home, you don't go back and do no more prayers because the prophet said there's only one winter. You, um, you end your prayer with one winter. Y'all hear that? So now if you want to pray more, then you don't do the witter with the Iman. Say for example, you want to go to the mosque, you're going to pray behind the Iman, but you want to do more prayers tonight, you're not going to do the witter. That's why the Iman pauses between those rakats. If you don't want, if you want to make more prayers, you leave. Go and, and don't do the witter. You guys understand it. So that's what you do, Marard. If you did not pray witter, 
or if you want to pray more prayers, don't pray the winter. It's just that simple. Just like yesterday when y'all saw Abu Usama uh, doing his Q&A, they prayed the winter last. Anybody, some brothers left. The people that left probably left because they plan on doing more prayers. So just don't pray that winter with them. Simple. Does that answer your question, Mara? And I want you guys to not be fanatics. Don't make this religion eat hard. You know, the, the night prayer is a voluntary prayer. It doesn't have more reward than Fodger. I want y'all to understand that praying Fodger is more rewards than the Tarawit. Praying Dhur is more rewards. Aser, more reward. Magria, more reward. Isha, more reward, because these are obligatory prayers. The night prayer is not even an obligation. To be honest, you don't have to pray the night prayer at all, period. And you'll still get the reward of the night of Cotter. I got to make it simple for y'all because some of you will beat yourselves up with fanaticism to the point where you give up. Some of us don't pray the night prayer at all. You don't have to. Some of us don't read the Quran at all. You don't have to. Reading the Quran, praying the night prayer brings more reward, but are they obligations during Ramadan? No. Do you get it? Can I still get the night of Qadr rewards if I don't read the Quran and I don't pray night prayers? Yes. You got it? But if you want to pray with the Iman, uh, pray more prayers at home, Marad, don't do the witter. Because once you do, do, do the witter, that's it. The witter is, you got the reward. What's the point in doing more prayers? You got the reward. Okay. I hope that answers his question. Because he keeps asking about this witter stuff. I don't know why. I don't know why, brother Marad. Did I answer your question, Brother Marat? Got it. Does that answer your question, Marat? Girl, Dr. Asim, still putting his little stuff up. <laughs> I'm glad that um, Sister Layla that you're explaining that because I try to get some some heads on that, you know, back in the day. Okay, wait a minute. Um, yeah, hold on for. Okay, what are you asking there, Marar? This this brother's killing himself. He really is. What are you asking me? If you want to go to the mosque and pray with the imam, go and pray. So I don't know what you're What are you asking me? What is he asking? I think what he's trying to say is, can he pray the, um, can he pray the night prayer with, even though he doesn't pray the Tarawiyah? Can he pray the night prayer without praying those Tarawih prayers that they pray This is why Arabs make fun of us. This is language. That doesn't make sense. Tara, I'm going to translate your question in English. And I can't, it's very crazy sounding. What you are asking is, Sister Layla, can I do the voluntary prayer in the first part of the night? Even if I didn't, I mean, no, you're asking me, Sister Layla, can I do the voluntary night prayer during the last part of the night if I didn't pray it during the first part of the night? Tara we is not a different prayer. Tara we means first part of the night. Tahajit means last part of the night. Kiyam means middle. So you're asking me, Sister Layla, if I did not pray when the nighttime first began, can I go to the masjid and pray in the middle of the night? Yes. Sister Layla, if I did not pray the night prayer when nighttime first began, 
Can I go pray in the last? You can pray any time up until Fajr. Do you understand? This is why Arabic people kind of make fun of y'all when y'all be mixing up these words when they shouldn't make fun of you. They should explain it to you. Brother, uh, for everybody listening, the night prayer is a voluntary prayer. It begins after Isha. And you can pray the night prayer anytime after Isha up until Fajr, the Adhan for Fajr. So if I want to pray the night prayer right before Fajr, I can do so. If I want to pray the night prayer right now, I can do so. If I want to wait till about two o'clock in the morning and pray the night prayer, I can pray. I can pray it any time after Isha before Fajr. You understand now? So Brother Marard, if you want to go to the mosque at three in the morning and pray with the Imam, yes, you can do that as long as you didn't do no prayer at home and end it with a witter. You understand? So if you want to go to the mosque and pray at three, go, go pray at three. Yeah, you can do that. And do his witter with him. Yes. You understand now? Guys, don't kill yourselves. Don't become fanatic and kill yourself with these voluntary deeds and mixing them up, not understanding what they are. Another example of verify your information. <laughs> well, see, that's a good example of how we got to verify, know what something is, otherwise we kill ourselves trying to do it. We thinking that it's three different prayers, Tarawi. Kiyam, Tahajit, these are Arabic words that refer to the different stages of the night. These words do not mean prayer. These words mean different stages of the night, the beginning of the night, the middle of the night, and the, uh, the last part of the night. That's what those words mean in English. They don't mean prayer. They're not separate prayers. They're just different parts of the, this way of telling time. Yeah, it's the wording. You got to know the meaning. And that's what Dr. Asim was emphasizing, guys. We have to know the meaning of these words. We get caught up in language. Yeah. Yeah, any other questions? Good question. Very good question, Brother Marard. So you can wait. If you want to go at three in the morning and pray with the imam, go pray with him. Yeah. Yeah, any other questions? So I have a question uh, about that prayer. Uh, there are times I'm not home and I pray, I pray with the group um, and I'll do a travel prayer and I end it with my witha uh, while I'm out. Then I come home and I wake up in the middle of the night um that's no it prayer. no prayer once you do that winter that's it that's it okay winter should be the last that that's once that's it you've ended it the winter means end the end okay there's no need to wake up anymore now if you want to get up in the morning and make some supplications that's what you guys can do if you guys pray the 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 tartar we at the mosque in the beginning with, with the imam, wake up in the middle of the night and make dua. You don't have to make rakats to talk to Allah. This is another misconception. We don't have to perform rakats to talk to Allah. You can talk to Allah anytime you want to. If I decide I'm going to do a night prayer, I'll make one rakat after Isha. And if I, I'm up all night doing videos, I talk to a lot. I'll sit here making the PowerPoint, texting people, and I'll take a break and say, Allah, forgive me of my sins. Allah, can you do this? You know, you can talk to a lot without making raw cops, guys. Y'all know that? Do that. That's what I do. I spend the whole night talking to a lot. I don't spend the whole night praying. I spend the whole night making videos, which is an act of worship, preparing my PowerPoint, which is an act of worship. And then while I'm doing those things, talking to Allah, which is also an act of worship. 
I don't have to, all that time for prayer. I can't do all that bending and bowing. I got bad knees. I do one rock cut, call it a night, but I talk to Allah all night long. See how easy that is? Real simple. Yeah, just talk to Allah. You ain't got to make no rock cuts. So if you want to wake up in the middle of the night and talk to Allah, do so. That's what I do. I'm always talking to him all night. My daughter think my granddaughter thinks I'm crazy. Say, who are you in? You talking to a law again? You need to lower your voice. <laughs> She'll be trying to sleep. Lower your voice talking to a law. <laughs> I'll be in the kitchen making coffee, talking to a law. Yep, that's how I just walk around or I'll vacuum the floor. Then I'll talk, say a law. You know, I just thought about something a law. And I get to talk. I mean, I just, I actually carry on conversations. My granddaughter be like, I can't sleep. Cause I'll stop vacuuming and say, you know what, Allah, I just thought about something. And I just start talking. <laughs> Everybody should have their own personal relationship with Allah. Get a, that's what you guys need to work on. Establish a relationship with Allah. So you can feel comfortable talking to him. <laughs> you don't have to pray to talk to him. Sister Leila. Uh-huh. Uh, so I have a question. So before the Eid prayer, we are supposed to give some money, right? That's a zakat like or fitter. Yeah, for you would give it for you and your and your and the baby, Hafsa. Is so and, and, uh, uh huh. Yeah, it's it's really it, it does you know the companions used to get food stuff. I'm gonna tell y'all why they don't get food stuff no more. Shay Gatley gave a good coot by about that one day. When I was married to him, I remember one Ramadan, he was kind of perturbed. <laughs> I'll never y'all remember that coot by it was 20 some years ago. He I think I still got that coot by in my server. He said. He was angry. He said, imagine waking up. What am I supposed to do with all this flour? I guess the people had brought bags of flour and bags of rice to the mosque. And he gave a kutba. He said, I guess the people supposed to mix the rice inside the flour and eat. And that's when he said, this is why people are taking money now, because the people are so unthinkable today. You would just go buy a bag of bar. First of all, in America, we don't eat barley. I'm sorry. My mother's Creole. My mother's from Louisiana. You know, you know how to eat crab legs, shrimp, gumbo. I wasn't raised on no barley. I don't even know what it looks like. And like Shea Gatley was saying, what you supposed to do with a bag of barley? Most people don't know what to do with it. That ain't no meal, not for us. So this is why the Imam started taking money. They would say, give me the $10 or give me the $12 and let us go out and buy. We'll buy the meat, we'll buy the fruits, we'll buy the vegetables so that the people in the, the, in the community, the needy people can make a meal. So that's why, and I agree with them on that. Yeah, it, it was from the Sunnah. The companions used to give barley. They used to give two sides of barley, two sides of flour, but we don't live. That was in the, the dark ages. Again, look at the time. That was the dark ages. The people, they milled their own flour and barley. Barley, they make soup, you know. I'm sorry, soup, soup ain't gonna help me. I'll die from eating all that soup, you know. I gotta get some protein. I have bariatric surgery. I need protein. So, so that's why the, the imams take money now. 
so that the imam can go out. And I know what Sheikh Atli does. Sheikh Atli goes out and buys all kind of meat, all kind of vegetables. He knows a good imam knows the needy people in his community. And they will take it to the people's house, the vet, the meat, you know, the vegetables, the potatoes, so the people can cook a nice meal to break, you know, to celebrate the breaking of the fast. That's the purpose of the Zakato fitter. So whatever your ma says, it could be $10, $8, however much they say, you pay it for yourself and, and the baby. So it would, if it's $10, that means that's $20 you would give to your mosque so they can buy the food for the needy people in your community. Otherwise, like Sheikh Atley said, you're going to be sitting up with bags of rice and flour and barley and the people going to, don't know what they can't eat with that stuff. The kids will look at it and say, I don't want that. Yeah. You understand, Elma? Um, yes, but can you just clarify how much? Is it like one day for one meal? Just one no, meal? You, yeah, but you, yes, but you have to call. It's based on the cost of living where you live. Yes, yes. You got to call the mosque. Did you call the mosque? Ask the mosque that where you live how much is the zakato fitter. Okay, I yeah, can you, ask them. Yeah, that's who you're supposed to ask. You're in a different uh, country. Yes. Yeah, so just call the mosque, the local mosque where you are, and, and ask them how much is the Zakato fitter this year, and they'll tell okay. you. Yeah, because okay. it's based on... Uh, and what, a, what yeah. about the part about uh, uh, the 2.5% of our wealth? That's different. That's not What's zakat that? fitter. That is not okay. zakat. You don't owe zakat. No, that's regular zakat. The yearly zakat has nothing to do with this. The yearly zakat yeah, okay. is what you pay on any money which you don't have. Any money that you have saved up at the end of the year, you know, you don't have that. You don't. You don't qualify for zakat. Yeah. Yeah, you're fine. Thank you for thank you for clarifying. I just got confused between those two. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you don't have to pay zakat. You don't, you don't meet the criteria. Yeah, but the zakat though fitter you do, and that's going to be just eight dollars or ten dollars or something. Yeah. And what about like uh, for the the ransom? The now the ransom uh, is the same thing. That's whatever it is. If it's eight dollars a day, you pay the uh, that uh, money uh, that amount of money for every day that you were unable to fast. Because you have to pay ransom. Yeah. Yeah. I have to pay that before the Eid prayer? Also? No, you pray that before next Ramadan. No. What has to be paid before the Eid prayer is the Zakato fitter. The Zakato fitter should be paid. I tell you guys to pay it a day or two before the Eid. Yeah. Pay that a day or two before the Eid, the Zakato fitter. Okay. The ransom. For those of you who fall in the category of ransom, you don't you have until the the beginning of next ramadan to pay it so you have a whole year you have a year to pay it everybody got that the ransom and thank god i can't believe i don't have to pay any ransom this year because i was able to fast i'm so proud of myself i was able to fast this year but look how i did it look how allah had me do it Stay up all night long and all morning and sleep until it's time to break fast for the afternoon. Sleep from 12 till uh, time to break fast. But at least I got through without no GERD attacks. And I did the whole month. Can't believe it. It's upon a lot. Yes, the purpose of the Zakato fitter. The purpose of the Zakato fitter is to make up for any mistakes you had in your fast. That day that you lost your temper and got into an argument with somebody, or, you know, that's what it makes up for any mistakes we had. And what is it? We got three days left of fasting. I would say, um, pay, I'll probably pay mine on Tuesday. I'll probably pay mine on Tuesday. Yeah. If my brother Issa don't pay it, because he usually pays it for me every year. I got to pay for me and Jayla.
Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Sister Lela, for the Zakat of Fitr, um, it's just for the family member that live in your household? That you, that's under your care. Yes, that's okay. under your care. So the if I have a guest in my house, I don't have to pay for her. Who? Like if I have a sister-in-law in my house, I don't have to pay for her, right? Do you take care of her? No, she's just here for vacation. No, no, no. no? It's a okay. that's just under your care. All right people that's that are under your care yeah that reminds me guys later on sabrina remind me to make a vacation for myself i'm gonna take myself to the mountains i want to go so bad that this is i'm gonna make a trip for me to go next month to the mountains inshallah so next month is may right Make me a trip for May uh, so I can go to Tennessee. I'm going to take myself to Tennessee. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, okay. All right, guys. Well, we did good with the class. I'm sorry I was late with it today, but uh, I, I was up for two, two days doing all these videos and stuff, but mashallah, we got it done. Um, I'm going to stay connected. I'm going to keep the keep us connected, so don't worry. I'm not going to close it. Well, do I need to? Yes. I got to get this recording, don't I? So what I'm going to do, guys, I'm going to close down to get my class, this class, so I can put the video out on it. And then I'm gonna open it back up for the, um, and I'll play lectures all night. I'll play Abu Usama's. For those of you who missed the lecture this morning, that lecture with Abu Usama was two, uh, two hours. I'm gonna play it, okay? I'm gonna log out to get this, take this down and I'll play it, all right? Okay, so Supana Kala Humo Wabi Hamdika, a shadow on Laila Haila Enta, stuck the Rukawa Tubi Lake. Give me five minutes. I'm just going to, I mean, five, yeah, five seconds, not minutes, seconds, because I'm just going to do this right here and then.